What's going on, everyone? Welcome to VV Investments. I appreciate you tuning in. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing certain things that the team needs to do before they market the platform and while they market the platform in order to reach the mass markets. So if you guys enjoy the video, make sure to like and subscribe. Comment down below what you want to see in a future episode. And without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy. All right, so I've had a couple people ask me and I did put out a tweet this past week asking what are some future things you guys want to see on the channel. I had an individual comment talking about localization, marketing, and you know, his questions behind why the team hasn't really done any of this stuff yet. Now, I will preface this video by saying that I have a background in marketing. By no means have I ever worked with a business of VV scale. I focus more on smaller businesses, dealerships, real estate brokerages, contractors, things of that sort. But to me, it's been very obvious why they haven't done things like localization, which is offering different languages on the platform and then marketing the platform. And what it comes down to is what you guys see on screen. So before we get into any of these points, I really, really need to emphasize the fact that laying a strong and secure foundation for any business is essential for that business to be successful. It's like the foundation of a home, right? If you build a crappy foundation, the home's just gonna end up falling over. At the end of the day, you don't wanna waste your time and your money. So the foundation of Vivi, it needs to be strong. Otherwise, the majority of the leads that they just end up bringing in are gonna fall right through the cracks. And this is something that I actually came across a lot back in 2020 when COVID started. I can't begin to tell you how many business owners I actually talked to who are running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Oh my God, I need more leads. Oh my God, I need more business. Oh my God, I need more sales. And what these business owners were doing is just tossing all their money into marketing and advertising, hoping that that would turn their business around. And so you had this perception back in 2020 about like all these businesses are going under because of COVID. And the reality was it wasn't because of COVID. It was because of their inability to adapt. COVID was nothing new. How many recessions, how many depressions, how many flipping pandemics have we been through in the past 100 years? And in many cases that I saw, these business owners were tossing money into advertising. These leads would come in and then they would fall right through the cracks. And the reality is this. It's not hard to generate a lead nowadays. The hard part is what you do with the lead when it comes in. So these business owners, instead of tossing money into advertising and marketing, hoping that it's going to help the company, they needed to patch the holes in the foundation of their business, take away certain systems, implement others, things of that nature before they start pouring money back into advertising. Because if they did that, once they turn their marketing campaigns back on, they're far more likely to convert the leads that they bring in. And this brings me to the second point. If you don't do this, it's ultimately going to cost you more time and more money. And in Vivi's industry, they can't afford that because if they waste too much time, their competitors get ahead. If they waste too much money, I'm sure everybody watching this video knows how fast a financial situation can change for a company in this industry. So it's crucial that the team does this right from the start and bringing in an individual like Mitch Mack is exactly why they did that was making sure that all of these holes are patched everything set up as best as possible before they turn on the green lights, start marketing, and these leads and users start pouring in. Another thing that people need to consider here is that nowadays consumers actually have the buying power, right? And that's because they have the resources at their fingertips to be able to compare Vivi to all of their competitors. So now, speaking of not patching holes, let's say Vivi doesn't patch the holes that they need to before they start marketing. Well, okay, new user finds out about Vivi, goes online to do a little bit of research, finds out we don't have OUP, finds out we don't have MCP, finds out that they don't even have the language that they speak offered on the app. Go on to Twitter, go to the comment section of Vivi's first tweet that they see, and then all of a sudden see all these futters complaining about XYZ. So before setting their marketing plan live, Vivi needs to make sure things like I just listed are all in place so that when a potential user comes in, they don't see red flags like that. And what it ultimately comes down to is why would somebody choose Vivi over Vivi's competitors? Palm, Quid, Eternity, McFarland, right? Vivi needs to make sure that they have all of these um, value propositions in place so that they have the competitive advantage over all those names I just listed. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about today is a social media push. So this is something that I largely expect when they mass market the platform doing things like creating engaging campaigns that are designed and catered to each of Vivi's target audiences, right? So we have adults on the platform already. We've had individuals like Al, David, and Dan talk about marketing the platform to kids and then using their ad campaigns to continue to gather and grow their customer database to use for retargeting purposes. So for those who don't know what retargeting is, I have an example that we're gonna walk through in just one sec here. In terms of Vivi's social media followings right now, they have 275,000 on Twitter, 114,000 on Instagram, 26,000 on Facebook, little over 56,000 on YouTube, little over 107,000 on Discord, and surprisingly, 
only a thousand on TikTok. So when we speak of mass marketing, we're talking about large audiences here. And you know, you can look at some of the IP on Vivi already, Coca-Cola, Marvel, Disney, Pixar, DC, the list goes on. All of these brands have larger followings than the platform itself. So the least I'd expect in the future is for Vivi to have followings in the millions as well. Now the example of retargeting that I'm gonna use is what's called a Facebook tracking pixel. Now, little disclaimer out there, technically speaking, this doesn't exist anymore. And this is only relatively recently since 2022. The reason I'm using this as an example though, is because it's what I'm most familiar with. So I don't wanna sit here and pretend to talk about something that I don't fully understand myself. A Facebook tracking pixel is something that I've used a lot in the past. It's something that I know very, very well. And despite it not being around anymore, there are still numerous tracking pixels and tools that VV and other businesses can use nowadays to gather customer data and use for retargeting purposes. So what a tracking pixel is first off is it's a piece of code that you attach to the header of your website. And what this line of code will do is it'll start to collect data from anyone who visits your page. Okay. This will help you do multiple things. So first it's going to help you track conversions from your Facebook ads. So how many people click on your ads and then become customers through your website. It'll help you optimize your ads. So essentially edit your ads in ways that'll allow you to maximize your time and your, your, your money spent on the, uh, the campaign. You can build targeted audiences for future ads. So what this essentially means is that based off the information that that pixel gathers, you can target a specific type of person, whether that's age range, location, interests, things like that. And then you can also remarket to people who haven't necessarily become customers of your business, but are aware and somewhat interested in what you have to offer. And that's the retargeting feature I discussed. So an example I'll use here is a car dealership. This is the best example I can give just given my experience. Let's say somebody goes into a car dealership website, clicks on a specific vehicle, but doesn't end up reaching out to the dealership. I can now run a retargeting campaign that targets specific individuals like that and will actually show them on the targeted ad the specific vehicles that they were already looking at. Because people today are far more likely to become a customer of your business the second, third, or fourth time around as opposed to the first. Anyone in the sales industry, I'm sure you guys have heard the term follow up, follow up, follow up is in the sale. It's the exact same thing online, retarget, retarget, retarget. All right, so this took me a little bit of time to find because again, guys, a Facebook tracking pixel doesn't technically exist anymore. But I actually have an old Chrome extension on my computer. If you look at the top right here, you're gonna see a little icon with a, uh, a green number one, the bottom right. What this is, is it's a pixel finder. So if I click on this, this tells me that this website actually does have a Facebook pixel attached to the website. So if I went into their inventory tab to take a look at their inventory, I click on a specific vehicle, that tracking pixel will actually pick up the step that I just took. And even if I don't make a request via their contact form, they can run a retargeting ad I can be on a completely different website, right? And I can see a photo for this vehicle advertising this dealership to bring me back. If you guys have ever gone onto a website, looked at a product or some sort of service that you guys haven't bought, then went on another website to see that exact same service or product being advertised, that is a tracking pixel. Another thing I expect to see a rise in is email marketing campaigns. So I am aware that the team does this for the drops right now. Uh, I did also see an email get sent out for the whole wire incident with their payment provider going under. But email marketing is gonna be considered a more traditional form of advertising. It still works very, very effectively today though, okay? So what it'll allow them to do is create personalized content or what's called a targeted drip campaign. And uh, essentially what a drip campaign is, is they would send out an email to one of their email lists, then three, four, five days could go by and they have a second email set up in that drip campaign that will go out and follow up on the first email that was sent out. Then there'll be a third email, 10, 11, 12 days after the second email gets sent out to follow up on the second email and so on and so forth. Now these email campaigns will allow a business like Vivi to collect feedback and surveys. It'll help generate additional traffic to the web app. So in this case, when they promote a drop via their emails, they do have a button at the bottom that says learn more. That takes them to the Medium article. So then they can set up other additional email campaigns that promote specific things on the web app that take them directly to the site, right? That would just be one example. And the last point that I have stated here is communication. Of course, this is key. And email campaigns are another way of keeping a strong line of communication with your audience. So like I said, when Wire, their payment provider went under, 
they did send an email out to us users, giving us an update and letting us know a little bit more information on what was happening. Similar to that of email marketing, we have SMS or text message marketing. So this would be a more modern version of email marketing. You're typically gonna have higher open rates than emails. That's a little self-explanatory, right? Cause it's going directly to your phone. Not everybody checks their email all the time. It's a very, very cost-effective method because it's direct and it's fast. Like I said, you're going direct to the customer and they're far more likely to be checking their phone more often than their email. But one thing to note with that is that the customer should always opt in or give their consent to receive these SMS messages. Vivi can't just start sending out text messages to all of its users and do this consistently because, you know, if you start to have a lot of people complaining, then that's going to flag the business. So consent is key, but once they get the consent from the user, then this will definitely help retain the user on the platform. So I have an example on the right there. The team talked about providing the physical frame for whoever wins the one of one auction on the app. In this case, they can send an SMS message to anyone who opts in. Hey there, great news. Your physical one of one frame has been shipped. You're going to expect in three to five business days and then something to help retain the individual to receive 10 bronze tickets with your next purchase. Use code, you know, blah, 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 blah which utilizes their promo code feature. Another thing that it would allow the team to do is actually track response data, which would make improvements easier for the team, right? So think of something like a Twitter poll. Maybe you have individuals opt into SMS alerts that ask them how to better the user experience. So you send out Twitter like polls as text messages to users who have opted into this. Get that feedback and then use that feedback to prioritize certain things that the team is working on. Next, we're going to talk about influencer marketing. So this is an obvious one, I'm sure to most. There's been numerous influencers with large followings that have actually expressed interest in the project. Salamandrin is one of those individuals as of recently. He's actually somebody that I watched several years back. He's a car guy. I'm a car guy. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. I've always been very business oriented. So that's why I was always interested. But he ended up going through this whole mishap where he bought like a million dollar plus car from McLaren and he was driving it on the road and it burst into flames. And then he ended up selling off all of his cars because McLaren screwed him over. And, you know, I stopped watching him after that. But what I will say with this point is that it's important that the team is careful with who they choose to work with. Right. You have another individual like Logan Paul who expressed interest in the project a couple of years back. I think this was in 2020. But for those who don't know, he's come under a bunch of controversy as of lately. I actually came across a post on Twitter this past week from an individual named Chris Zachman, and I'm not 100% sure if this is legit, so I do caution anyone who reads this, I'll toss it on screen. But he said, in 2020, I worked with a company called Omi, founder of Pokemon was on the team. They contacted Logan to promote, which opened him to the world of crypto. We knew that he will spiral out of control and end up really screwing a lot of people and himself three years later, dot, dot, dot. So I don't know if this is some, you know, individual just trying to get a little bit of clout here. But if that is the case, good call on Vivi's part. Um, another example that I'll use as of recently is Kanye West. Obviously, you guys know some of the things that he's been saying and some of the major brands that have been dropping him. Another just great example of be careful who you choose to work with. I'm going to brush past this one relatively quickly because it is very similar to our previous point. It's just focusing more on brands than actual influencers on like YouTube and other social media platforms but sponsoring brands and then promoting Vivi to the audiences of the brands that you're sponsoring. This would be a way to generate more brand awareness for Vivi, additional sales from new users hopping on the app and purchasing NFTs, and then positive PR, hopefully. Not always the case, but reputation management is something that I am gonna discuss later on in this video. It's crucial that Vivi maintains a positive reputation, and right now I understand that in the community, there's a negative sentiment. The only thing that I'll add here is again, very similar to that of influencers. Be careful who you choose to sponsor and work with here. I'm sure everybody has heard about the FTX situation. A lot of the businesses that chose to work with FTX or sponsor FTX were actually put in the spotlight and came under a lot of fire. Same with the wire situation. I'm not even gonna talk about this a lot because I really don't even think that there's anything to talk about here, but people complaining about the fact that it's Vivi's fault with the whole wire situation. Guys, Vivi sits down and does their due diligence with a payment provider like that. Do you really think that if they're sitting in a meeting and then all of a sudden see a bunch of red flags, they're still going to go, yeah, we want you as a payment provider. Of course, they didn't see anything in their initial meetings, but it's a prime example of how fast the financial situation of a business can change in this space. Okay. There are clearly certain things that Vivi didn't know about that business that even certain individuals within Wired didn't know. 
So all these people making the argument about how it's Vivi's fault because they didn't do the proper due diligence when they initially signed Wire, bogus. Next, we're gonna talk about accessibility. So VV collectibles need to be offered and promoted in more places than just the app. In the most recent community update video, David did talk about how fidgetals are planned for 2023. I've talked about in previous videos how they could possibly be pairing fidgetals with promo codes, right? Allowing users to pair the digitals with the physicals. We've also talked about things like affiliate marketing. So let's say we have a bunch of affiliate links associated with VV NFTs in the description of various YouTube videos. Those would just be additional locations where somebody can click on that link and find VV NFTs. It would kind of act as like bridges, right? Between potential customers and uh, in the web app. And then third party contests and competitions I also have on there. So we've already had brands like Epico do competitions to earn Omi and collectibles, but then also Marvel has done airdrops and raffles to their audience as well. Another thing discussed in the most recent community update video was major brand announcements and that the team will be making more major announcements throughout 2023. Now, of course, we don't know what these brands are or what these announcements are going to be, but provided they're large IP, when these announcements are made, it's only going to draw new users to the VV app from the audiences of the brands that were announced, right? Take Pokemon as an example. I'm not saying Pokemon's going to be on the app. But Pokemon is a brand where wherever it goes, its audience tends to follow. Now, speaking of Pokemon, it has also been confirmed by the team. I think it was David specifically who said that they have multiple licenses like the size of Pokemon in their pipeline. So when we have brands like this announced this year, I think it's fair to assume that we'll see an influx of users following. Third party marketing is exciting to me. Um, in the past, the team has been clear that they've actually limited how their licensors can advertise VV if they're allowed to advertise the platform at all. We've seen Marvel and Disney brands like those who have promoted VV in the past, but the team stated that once they are ready to market the platform properly, it'll be quite easy to go to their licensors and kind of give them the go ahead to do the same thing. So if you look at some of the IP on VV, Marvel, 67 million followers. Disney has over 160 million active users on Disney Plus. Star Wars, 15 million plus followers. DC Comics, 13 million plus, right? And the number of users on Vivi right now are a fraction, like fraction, fraction of these numbers. So when we talk about mass marketing the platform, in addition to things like social media and targeted ads and SEO and all these, you know, standard advertising methods, Vivi can also leverage promotions and advertising through their own licensors. And speaking of third-party marketing, community members are also gonna play a huge role in this, especially when it comes to the Viviverse, right? Providing content through the Viviverse that's just gonna further promote the platform. Number 10, listed on more exchanges. So this is something that's been discussed and highly anticipated by the community for a while now. The team has mentioned that they have multiple exchanges lined up in the pipeline. When I originally got in on this project in March of 2021, they actually said that they expected to be on three major exchanges by end of the year, and that was 2021. So now being in 2023, and with people like Reese confirming that they've still maintained relationships with these exchanges, and that they're maintaining the relationships until they decide to just give the green light, I'm sure they have many more than just three in the pipeline. And the reason why they haven't listed the token on multiple exchanges by now is again, something that's been stated by Reese in the past, and that's because it just hasn't been the right time. This is in relation to market conditions globally, right? The whole world economy has been on a teeter totter, but then also pending regulations in the crypto and NFT space, keeping in mind that different regulations are being formed in different countries all over the world. And this is something that Vivi has to keep an eye on. Next up, platform upgrades. So this is something that the team needs to do before they even start marketing the platform, right? The current version of the platform is not capable of hosting millions of users. We already saw this happen when we saw the influx of users back in January. So making sure that they add or fix features that we discussed in episode 35, I'll link that in the description for further context and just making the whole user experience more smooth and enjoyable. Now, one thing I wanna add with this, okay? And it's something that I should have included in episode 35. I forgot to, so I'm just going to include it in this point because Vivi is a collecting app. They need to avoid the confusion between first edition and first appearance tags because this is ultimately going to have an impact on what collectors choose when they first come on the app. All right. On the right hand side, I have Steve Rogers, Captain America, as an example. For those who don't know, when Captain America originally dropped on the app, 
The first appearance was Steve Rogers, which was part of Series 1 Marvel Mighties. They then dropped Series 1 with five different statue variants, as you guys see in the bottom right there. But when they dropped Series 1, that also had the first appearance tag on it. So then the community kind of started voicing this. They said, hang on a second, if Steve Rogers has the first appearance tag, then why does Series 1 have it as well? And so what ultimately happened, Vivi ended up putting out a tweet and said, you know, the community's right. We're going to take the first appearance tag off. The first appearance tag will remain with Steve Rogers, but we'll take it off of Series 1 with the five statue variants. So I'm looking at that situation. I'm like, okay, perfect. They listen to the community. But they just did the exact same thing with Black Panther. They dropped Series 1 Black Panther with five different statue variants with a first appearance tag. They then airdrop a Black Panther Marvel Mighty with a first appearance tag to holders of the full Black Panther set. That's fair. But the first appearance tag should not also be on the Marvel Mighty. It's an exact repeat of the Captain America situation, just opposite ways they dropped. Another example that I could use here, and some people are not going to like this example, but Mickey's signature. One of the things that those lenticular cards have going for them is the signature on the back. And in my opinion, when you drop Mickey's signature with a first edition tag on it, that now devalues the signature on the back of the lenticular card. So before I could say that the lenticular cards change based off the angles you look at, it also has audio, and then it has the signature of the character on the back. Now I can really only say the first two, because even though it has the signature on the back, it's completely devalued by an older piece that dropped on the app that has the first edition tag. So I'm not trying to cause FUD here. What I'm actually trying to do is avoid the FUD from new collectors that come on the app. Because guys, this is a collecting app. So getting the first edition and first appearance tags should be like, at the very basic level, something that the team should be getting right. Number 12, we're going to talk about localization. So localization, for those who don't know, is adding multiple languages onto the app. So in order for Vivi to appeal to mass markets, Vivi needs to cater the platform to those audiences, of course, right? But somebody can't hop on a Vivi if they don't speak the English language. So they have to offer different languages on the app for those who don't speak the language, okay? With that being said, however, this is much easier said than done. So this was one of the comments on that post I put out on Twitter about what are some things I should discuss in the future. The individual is wondering, you know, why has VB taken so long to add multiple languages? Okay. And if you really, really think about this, here are just some examples of what the team actually has to do to make this happen. First, they have to recruit members who speak the languages of interest, right? So based on the languages that they want to put on the app, whether that's 10, 15, 20, they have to have individuals that are capable of speaking all of those languages. They then have to convert all of the existing content, right, on the app, the web app, medium articles, right, medium articles pertaining to drops, OUP, MCP. When you think of OUP and MCP articles, they also have graphics, right, for the roadmap and diagrams. All of that has to be converted into each and every one of those languages. When they also flip those switches and they have those languages on the app, they also have to be in a position where they can produce all future content in each and every one of those languages reliably. And then they also have to have a customer support team capable of answering inquiries in all of the languages offered. I just listed four points. Think of how much time it would take just to get those four points done. But in addition to what I just listed, there are many other things that the team would have to implement in order to roll out localization. We previously mentioned affiliate programs. I'm going to brush past this one as well, but providing some way to reward your loyal fans for promoting the project to new users would only help the platform grow faster. We talked about it back in episode 23 about how this is something that actually took Amazon to its next level. This is also something that a majority of large brands nowadays provide. Tesla is another great example. You buy a Tesla, you're given an affiliate link, and now you can provide that link to anyone who's interested in buying a Tesla. You'll get a commission of the sale. It'll provide a new revenue stream for Vivi. It's a very cost effective method in doing so. And as we previously mentioned with maintaining a positive brand reputation, this would also be a good way in helping increase a brand's reputation. The more people you see talking about the brand in a positive light, the more social proof that business will have. Again, going back to Amazon, Amazon would not be where it is today if it weren't for the review system. You never go on Amazon and buy a product that has less than four or five stars, right? I always click the review section 
and look at what people are saying about their experiences with the product that I'm interested in getting. If you guys haven't checked it out already, this is something that we talked about back in episode 23. I'll make sure to link that in the description down below. The VVverse is going to be another one that's very obvious to many watching this video as well. The team has talked about rolling out home spaces in Q1 of 2023. So this is going to provide additional content produced by the community from inside of the VVverse. And this additional content is only going to promote VV more. When you start to see content creators like myself producing content with their avatars, when you start to see people, you know, doing tours of their home spaces, when you start to see jobs created inside of the VVverse, public private events being held, land sales, right, with Alluvium, but then also examples like Sandbox and Decentraland, all of these things are going to promote VV more as a business. So point number 15 is going to be MCP and OUP. Another point that I'm going to brush by relatively quickly here. Okay. These are two things that have been discussed by the team time and time again. So I don't really think that I need to sit here and, you know, and just reiterate the same things that they've said. But what these two things are ultimately going to do, the MCP or the Master Collectors Program is going to incentivize collectors to continue to buy and collect VV NFTs on the VV app. And then the OUP or the OMI Utility Program is going to help incentivize investors to buy and stake the OMI token on the crypto side of things. The token right now needs many more use case scenarios, or in other words, needs more utility. And the OMI Utility Program is going to help do that. Speaking of utility, NFT utility, another thing discussed in the most recent community update video by David. So this is another focus for the team in 2023, rewarding long-term collectors and holders of full sets. So we've seen this happen more often on the app as of recently. Again, the Black Panther airdrop for those who secured the full set. We have the Batman Blue and Yellow series that was actually airdropped to holders of the Black and White series, the first series to ever drop on VV. But what it ultimately comes down to is that we need to be able to use our NFTs in more ways than just augmenting them into reality and holding them in our vaults, right? This was actually discussed by David, not in the most recent decon. I think it was, it was a couple of them now, but he was asked the question and he talked about the fact that, you know, a lot of people are focused on interoperability and making sure that our NFTs can go over to OpenSea. David made the comment about how the team is really thinking much further than this. And that he recognizes that we need more ways to be able to use our collectibles than the current ways offered on the app. And something else we're going to discuss today is utilizing artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence scares me, to put it blunt. It, it really it really does. Um, however, with that being said, I understand that this is not something that I'm, I'm going to be able to avoid. Artificial intelligence, it's just a matter of time before it really gets implemented into society. You already see a ton of people in the community creating art photos. So the team can combine the data that they collect with expert machine learning that makes better consumer predictions and product suggestions that the team can use and elevate the business. Recognizing customer behaviors, analyzing customer responses, right? To surveys sent out into the community, social and advertising performance, right? So using AI to help better optimize your advertising campaigns. They can use AI for fraud detection. I'd actually be surprised if they aren't doing this already. Going back to advertising, right? You can use AI to set up advertising messages that are tailored to specific individuals. We've had some people in the community complain about VV's customer service, right? So maybe they can implement an AI chatbot that would allow users who are still waiting to speak with an actual human being to perhaps be able to mitigate their situation via the chatbot. Now, going back to the two-part series I did on Akomi's partners and providers, there was one company on that list called Versus. I didn't include it in my video series because it was one of the businesses that I found the website for, but I couldn't confirm if it was a company that was working with Akomi or not. And I actually went even as far as reaching out to the business to try and confirm some sort of, you know, working relationship that they have with the team. I didn't get a response, but that business was all focused on artificial intelligence. So if that is the right business, I'd be curious to see how the team has already implemented AI. Alrighty, so that is going to conclude today's points. Those are just some of the things that the team needs to do beforehand and while they market the platform in order to reach mass markets. If you guys are thinking of anything in particular that I didn't discuss in today's video, please comment it down below. I'd be very interested in seeing how you guys are thinking. But if you enjoy the content, make sure to like and subscribe. Comment down below what you want to see in a future episode. And as for the next one, I'll catch you then.